So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're going to start our program. Uh, thank you all for coming and joining us with in our second series of Tea with Bertice. And today we're honoring the legacy of Delilah Pierce, along with her family members and our special guest, Dr. Deborah Ambush. Uh, I am Bertice of Gallery Bertice, and the cameraman this evening is my husband, Alex. Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to put the mic down and see if I can talk because I need my hands to operate, mm -hmm. uh, handle other things. So, um, the exhibition's title is Hidden Masters Artists Rising Above Anonymity. And we're honoring those artists like Delilah Pierce, whose careers were eclipsed by their contemporaries. They came along during the same period of time, creating extraordinary bodies of work, exhibiting alongside prominent artists, but did not receive the same level of recognition. And so throughout the series, we will be honoring artists as Delilah Pierce, who uh, were just as, who were equally as talented, equally committed to their artistic career, but just didn't rise above um, anonymity. And so there are many. And since this series began, our phone has been ringing off the hook with people responding to the title uh, and sharing the stories of their aunts and uncles, uh, brothers and sisters who left behind a legacy that needs to be brought to the forefront. So I'm going to um, introduce starting with Dr. Ann Bush, who holds a, master of, a master's and PhD degree in art education from Ohio State University. She currently chairs the National Art Education Association Affiliate Committee on Multi-Ethnic Concerns. She is an adjunct professor at the Corcoran where she teaches Introduction to Research Methods and a course on Assessment, Evaluation, and Quality. Her work in art education spans over 30 years, has been highlighted by several awards, including the Montgomery County Education Association, Jaworski, Jaworski, sorry, not fluent in Polish language, <laughs> Jarmorski Civil Rights Grant, Maryland Art Education Association Educator of the Year Award, Montgomery County Public Schools Women in the Arts Award, Getty Fellowship in Art Education, and the Ohio State University Dean's Fellowship. Dr. Bush will share her experiences in working with Ms. Pierce while in graduate school at Ohio State University, and the important role that Eta Phi Sigma sorority played in their relationship. Additionally, Dr. Bush will bring to light the numerous collaborations the two share in both institutional and homespun settings, where the serious work of cultural enrichment, promotion of ethnic pride, and the support of social causes took place. And in terms of family members, we have the great niece of Delilah Pierce, who holds a graduate degree in project management specializing in entrepreneurship. She is currently the Director of Administration, Chief Financial Officer at Central Union Mission. Um, and Wanda McDowell um, is also a very talented artist in her own right, so the artistic genes run throughout the family. <laughs> yeah. And also joining us this afternoon is the niece of Delilah Pierce, Miguel Spence, um, who will also chime in whenever she'd like to share some of the family stories about uh, Delilah. So I'd like to begin with um, a, a short presentation on Delilah Pierce, who's featured in this photograph, along with the painting that's on the, the wall there, which is the Long Bridge. Delilah Pierce was born in Washington, D.C. in 1904. Um, she served as an art educator, artist, and curator. She uh, attended minor normal teacher's college, the predecessor of 
the University of the District of Columbia. She has also <coughs> earned a BS degree from Howard University, and she received a master's in art and art education from Teachers U College Columbia University in New York City. And she received an honorary a doctorate degree of humane letters from the University of the District of Columbia. And she had so many, as I began to research and learn more about Delilah Pierce, I also began to understand just the depth and breadth of her talent, her contributions, and her commitment to art education um, in terms of her teaching. And she was also really um, kind of at the, the forefront of the women's movement in art. And I say that because in 1962, she received a she was the recipient of the Agnes Mayer Sumner Fellowship, which allowed her to travel to and study the works of um, travel abroad, being Europe and the Middle East and Africa, where she studied the works of Western, Middle Eastern, and African civilizations. She visited places such as Greece, Holland, London, Paris, Rome, Lebanon, the Holy Land, and the River Jordan. In Africa, she traveled to Cairo, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Nigeria. Now, if you had attended our previous tea, you would have learned that it wasn't until the 1970s that women um, protested because they weren't being treated um, in the 1970s, I should say there was a major uproar and protest of women in the United States and in um, England because they were being so marginalized. In, um, and uh, Faith Ringgold was actually one who, um, Faith Ringgold is an African-American woman artist who protested against the Met because women artists, women of color, were not being allowed to exhibit. So we talked about the marginalization of women artists. In the 70s, there was this protest against the establishment and men suppressing women and artists. And to think that in 1962, that Delilah Pierce received this fellowship and went abroad is something to be noted and to be recognized and honored because that was really something very phenomenal. And she was 58 years old at the time. So just take that in, because I was taken aback by the information, and then when I did the math in terms of her age, it was just an extraordinary event, and I'm sure it, w it had a great impact on her life. Um, as an educator, she taught at the junior and senior level in uh, DC public schools. Her teaching positions were the assistant professor of art at the T DC Teachers College, which was from 1952 to 71 when she retired. And she was a visiting professor at Howard University from 68 to 69. Um, and I just wanted to note just a few of her 150 plus exhibitions because as an artist who uh, operated just slightly be below the radar, even though she was included in exhibitions with her peers who become, became very well known, it's important for me to put her into context with them. So note that in 1952, she was one of the artists that was in a group exhibition at the Smithsonian uh, Institute then, which is now the American Museum of American Art. Uh, the, the title of the exhibition was the 15th Metropolitan State Art Contest. In 58, she was at the Corcoran Gallery of art. In 59, at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And in um, 59, she also had a solo exhibition at the Margaret Dickey Gallery, which was part of UDC's um, gallery space. Um, Alex, could you please ask um, Aiden and uh, Ali to pass out the information? I have a draft that I want to share with you. Um, we did a graph to show the exhibitions that Delilah was included in, and the graph also demonstrates the artist who became very prominent that she was in, um, featured with. 
She also studied with Lois Marley Jones, Celine Tavery, printmakers Ralph Pearson, Jack Perlmutter, and James Bell. And in the 1930s, she studied with James Porter. All of these artists, both black and white, became very prominent during their lifetime. All right, so <coughs> Dad Mills, um, this piece was featured in an exhibition called Six Washington Masters, which was ex exhibited by Evan Tibbs, the Evan Tibbs Gallery. So if you know the history of Washington, you know that Evan Tibbs played a major role in helping to promote, support, um, and educate people about art. And in, from that exhibition, there was a catalog that was produced titled Six Washington Masters. Um, in the catalog, uh, Tibbs, who was the head of the organization, commented on stating that early works, and I'm quoting, such as daffodils completed during the 1950s, exhibits her affinity with abstract expressionists, gaining recognition during this time. While her abstracts present recognizable forms, the art does not radi radicalize the subject matter into pure line and color. So early on, Delilah was demonstrating her proficiency in abstraction. And while this is abstract that is recognizable, its, its approach is abstract-like. The second piece that is highly written about is the cellist. And again, thinking about the, the daffodil piece and then his next comment is about the cellist. Executed during the same time as daffodils, shows the artist's ability to manipulate her abstract vocabulary by using the human form and employing rhythmic lines to reinforce this composition's musical subject matter. And there, I read in another quote in another doc document that I received that her husband is quoted as saying that he believes the cellist is one of her finest works. And this piece um, is featured in American Negro Art by Cedric Dover. Uh, it was featured in the solo exhibition at the Margaret Dickey Gallery and then also at the Sixth Washington Masters Gallery, the Evan Tibbs Gallery, in 1983. So when I first began working with the family, I was struggling to find documents, information about Delilah Pierce. One of the things that she did, which is a curator's dream, is that she was very meticulous about keeping original catalogs from her exhibitions, notes, letters, they have a copy, well I have copies, they have the original, a letter from the Farnay Aiden Gallery, so it was just wonderful. And so from those documents, I was able to broaden my research and find where she was mentioned in books, where she was written about uh, by other people. Uh, this piece is important because it was done in 1963. After her return from um, Africa. And let's see. This piece is written about in the book titled The Black, I'm sorry, The Art of Black American Women works of 24 artists of the 20th century by Robert Henkes, Henkes, H-E-N-K-E-S. Um, and in that, he talks about several other pieces, but this piece, Sudanese Bazaar and Sudanese Tradesmen, um, in it he refers to Pierce's concern with and compassion for people of a strange land and talks about the fluidity and the calculation and the composition of the painting. The other reason that this piece and the other I will share with you is significant 
is because Tibbs also comments on it, stating as a result of her trip to Africa, Pierce was exposed to aesthetics and environmental design influences that would emerge in her later work, such as the Forest series, which where mythical light sources illuminate strong vertical elements representing trees or other natural objects. And so this is the other piece, it's done in 64. And here we have the Nature Symphony one. So through that research, I was able to determine Gail Smith, this is out of Gail's collection, and I could not, the piece is not dated, although it is signed. And through their writings, I was able to place this piece in the year in which it was created. And so you see the illumination, the way it's a night scene, the way she illuminates the trees with the, the sun, the moonlight. And again, you see the work becoming more and more abstract. Which takes us to the nebula patterns, the nebula series, which again, you know, going into this, struggling to find information, and then as I go through Miss Pierce's notes and start tearing apart and following up all the leads that she left for me, um, I realized that this body of work was intriguing to many and was written about time and time again. And I believe in part because during that time, the, the production of African American artists, the aesthetic was, in most cases, autobiographical. So the imagery was mostly figurative, florals, and stories of everyday life. Well, Ms. Pierce comes along, as many artists did, but they challenge the status quo and create work that was different, intriguing. And so in this series, which again, and Juet Day, who was an artist, one of Ms. Pierce's contemporaries, who came along and wrote beautifully about the series. Her nebulae series are compositions of explosive geometric patterns with warm, glowing centers and energetic particles. Nebulae originated as Delilah inadvertently looked into the sunshine while painting. The light was so powerful, it caused her to squint. When she opened her eyes, she saw shapes, forms, and particles whose, whose crystalline formation suggested a gas, gaseous explosion. Later, she discovered there is a scientific explanation of nebulae. It is defined as any of several vast, diffused, cloud-like patterns seen in the night sky consisting of groups of stars too far away to be seen singularly, masses of gaseous matter or of external galaxies. Delilah paints these galaxies in her own creative, imaginary way. And Robert Hicks also um, wrote about this and said that she, her portrayal of color <coughs> and shape, there is no inner drive to resolve racial inequalities or injustices but rather a momentary freedom from personal obligations. The spirit is uplift, uplifted, re resulting in joyous celebration. And Tibbs also wrote about it, and he references one of her contemporaries. Um, Pierce's compositions show an affinity with the mosaic-like works of Alma Thomas's last major paintings and the design pattern and color of West African fabric. However, he notes, Pierce has evolved in her nebulae series as a surrealism that Thomas rarely exhibited. So while he recognizes that there are similarities in the work, he pays homage to and, and, and helps us to understand that while the influences may have been the same, Delilah, it was her own. She really took that on and made that style her own. And these are other works that are part of that series. And you can see that the strokes, the style, the approach in terms of the shapes within each piece are, are very similar. 
And unfortunately, I could not find a date on the piece for the Uncle Thomas. But I do know that the nebulae for the level of this EB2. And now I wanted to just show where locations and other things um, inspired works by these artists. Each woman owned a home, and the family still owned homes in the vineyard. And so they were each inspired by the water there um, and the seashore. And so as a curator, I am going to take the position that this scene was probably painted in the same area. Because if you look at the boat house, and the boats and the water line, you see that there's, it's very, very similar. One was done, the Nimsha was done by Lois Halvey Jones in 1941, and the line of Pierce's in 57. Now uh, here, making another assumption, because there is no documentation for me to clarify this, I, my assumption is that when Delilah went to um, Paris, Celine Tabary was a contemporary of the Lois, Lois Milo Jones and Delilah Pierce. Um, and I'm making an assumption that the red houses possibly be in the same area. The scene may have been spot the paintings were perhaps inspired by the same landscape. And here, outside of people that she may have worked directly with, I saw a similarity in the the nude bathers mm -hmm. by each. Mm -hmm. And the paint yeah. the painting on the right is by Cezanne. And of course, the one on the left is by Delilah Pierce. So I actually emailed Delilah's to the Baltimore Museum of Art. I know the director there and the curator and said Delilah was also, they had a Paul Cezanne exhibition. And I sent this painting and said Delilah Pierce was also inspired by Paul Cezanne. <laughs> <laughs> so I love this painting because just how the composition of it. She took this horizontal landscape on a rectangle canvas and put it in a circular design. And I just thought it was just masterful. Um, and I really love it. And then this piece, this phenomenal triptych, which is here, was done in um, 1980. Um, it was featured at the Inspiration 1961 through 1989 exhibition held at the Anna Costi Museum, which was a really important exhibition. I am fortunate enough to have the catalog. Um, the artist featured in this exhibition was just incredible. Um, Delilah Pierce, of course, she served as a curator for the exhibition. It also included James Wells, Lois Mabel Jones, Elma Thomas, Juliet Day, Corinne Mitchell. I mean, the list goes to a book. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> you can tell Gloria Freeman, I'm Gloria Green. Oh my God. Oh wow. Yes. Oh, wow. One of my paintings, um, they used the Little Master Artist. That was the piece that they used for to send out a poster. They made a poster of it, a flyer, and it was in the newspaper advertising this show. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So this was a seminal exhibition. And fortunately, a catalog was created. Many of the exhibition's catalogs were not done. So we try to rely on postcards. And if we have a postcard, we may only have the image of one piece on it. So we don't know what artwork was featured in the exhibition. So fortunately, this catalog serves an important part of history, of African American art history for us all. And we know that, um, that nature was 
Delilah Pierce's muse. Yes. I mean, she really knew how to just, she was so proficient at it, and the landscapes and the seascapes that she created were just phenomenal. This angle wing begonia is out of their Patricia and Ronald Walters collection. This is a watercolor painting, which is absolutely stunning. This is another one of her still life pieces, which I just absolutely loved. And she studied under James Porter, and if you know James Porter's work, you know that he did flowers like no one else. I mean, he was just wonderful at still life. And I believe that um, Delilah and her influence of his, she took it and she extracted the painting. Um, she also did figurative work. And this lovely piece, Supplication, was written about by Robert Hinkins, Hinkins uh, book, The Art of Black American Women. And in this, he talks about the beauty, the woman's hands, and how lovely they are, her eyes, and looking towards the heavens. Um, we believe that this, the background of the piece is probably row houses in Washington, D.C. We may have talked about that. Uh, this piece, Twins, was featured in the 1952 Smithsonian Exhibition. And then I included this one because it's a little whimsical. <laughs> it's Wanda's favorite, one of her favorite pieces. It's inspired by Peter Pan, and it was just so different, and I really love it, and I just wanted to share this piece with you because it's so different. And it just shows another uh, artistic approach of Delilah's, and uh, I I've never seen anything in the collection like it. So I wanted to share that with her. I think she gave, well. to my, she gave it to us when I was like five or six. It was a gift to my mother to give to, give to me. But then she said, well, I'm going to take it back home and save it. <laughs> <laughs> you all might do something to it. So she, <laughs> so she took it back home. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So now I'd like to turn to Dr. Ambush, um, who is going to talk about her relationship with the Lila Pierce. The image that you're looking at is from a catalog. I did not have the year. Which year did this exhibition take place? 1992. In 1992. And if you look closely, you will see uh, the Delilah Pierce is one, two, three. From my left, she is the fourth person from my left. Sitting. Sitting. Seated. I'm sorry. Seated. Yeah. Seated. E.J. Montgomery is in the black dress. And then the third person over is Delilah Pierce. Dr. Ambush is on the right, standing one, two, the third person in from the from the right. Uh, Lois Malu Jones is almost dead center with a black outfit on. Now, is there anyone yes, else? We both are there. Okay. I was the president at the time. Wonderful. Where are you, Sandy? I, I'm, I'm in the back on the end, I think. Yeah. All right. You're on the right, the first person. <laughs> and I'm on the right. All right. Uh, okay. Beautiful. 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 I'm going to turn the over to you. 